today we're beginning a brand new series called Pursuing Your Potential. Let me begin by telling you this story. You know, oftentimes people ask Kathy this question, why she married me. I don't know why people keep asking her this question. And they, you know, say, they say it sort of incredulously, like, why did you marry Mark? And she always gives them the same answer. She says, well, he had potential. <laughs> and you know, I never really liked that answer. So, well, he was sort of a loser, but he had potential. And in fact, I actually asked her to marry me twice. You probably don't know this. First time I asked her, she said, no. And I said, why won't you marry me? Is there someone else? She said, there's got to be. <laughs> And so we want to talk about this thing calling pursuing our potential. And uh, I believe God gives every single one of us a great potential. And it's a funny thing because I think what you do is when you read books on this, it's funny the titles they come up with. Most of them are this, Reaching Your Full Potential. And actually, there's dozens of books by that same exact title. And here's my point. If you could ever reach your potential, then that somehow denies the way God has created you. Because I think that we all have actually a limitless potential. And I think that potential is really a journey, not a destination. You can never fully reach it. How many of you remember uh, years ago, it still actually lingers this myth that they always used to say you only use 10% of your brain power. How many, how many of you remember hearing that? I mean, it's been very common. It's been going on for years and years. It's not true. You don't use only 10%. The latest things are saying you might be using up to 20%. Well, that's good news. I'm twice as smart as I thought I was, but still one-fifth as smart as I could be. And here's my point that we're going to drive home today, is that every one of us has essentially a limitless potential, and we don't need to try to reach it. What we need to do is try, try to reach for it or pursue it. And it's this journey. And I don't care how old you are, you will never fully reach your potential, and you need to continue to try and to continue to pursue it. There was a Spanish cellist by the name of Pablo Casals, and he was the world's greatest cellist. And when he was in his final years of life, a reporter asked him this question and said, Mr. Casals, you're 95 years old. You're the greatest cellist that ever lived. Why is it that you still practice six hours a day? To which he said, because I think I'm still making progress. 95 years old and still making progress. I love that. You know, ever since I turned 60, it's been driving me crazy. People have been asking me this question. So Mark, when are you retiring? I think, what do you mean, when am I retiring? I haven't even peaked yet. Why do you want me to retire? I'll tell you when I'll retire. I'll retire when you drag my decrepit body off the pulpit, drooling and repeating myself. <laughs> drooling and repeating myself. <laughs> then, 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 you, then you know I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to be like that guy, 95 years old, who goes to the doctor, and he says, Doctor, something's wrong with me. Every morning I wake up, and when I look in the mirror, I feel like throwing up. What's wrong with me? The doctor says, I don't know, but your eyesight is perfect. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do today. We are going to look at the Peter Principle, I'm calling it. And how many of you remember from 1969 a book called The Peter Principle? How many of you remember this? A bunch of you my age will remember. Here's the book. It was written by Dr. Lawrence Peter. And the Peter principle was simply this, that people will tend to rise to the level of their incompetence. And so even though they're good at something down here and they get moved up to the next level and they, they're still competent, and then they finally get promoted to the place of their incompetence. How many of you, if you're really honest, you have a boss like that and you're wondering, how did he ever get here? Why is my staff all putting up their hands? <laughs> there's, there's something really wrong with this. And there's some sort of truth to that, but we're going to actually look at a different Peter principle today. We're going to be looking at a Peter principle according to Simon Peter, because I think he actually disproves this. In fact, I think he's got it completely in reverse. Here was this guy that I would say started as an incompetent and went to become one of the greatest people in all history. When you think about it, a little anonymous fisherman from the Sea of Galilee goes down in history as one of the most famous people of all time. And when you look at him, I mean, he didn't have winter written all over him. Would you say that? I mean, when you look at him, he goes fishing, he hardly ever catches fish. When you look at him, he was always bumbling, stumbling, he was putting his foot in his mouth, he was impetuous, he was short-tempered. Uh, I mean, one time he said something so stupid that Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. If Jesus is calling you Satan, you've got work to do, right? You, you have room for improvement. 
And I don't think as you read the Gospels, I don't know about you, but when I read the Gospels and read the story of this Peter, he didn't look like he had this obvious genius to me. I mean, he was no Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo or Donatello or any of the other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I, I don't think he had this obvious potential and obvious genius. His yearbook quote probably would have been least likely to succeed. And yet, look what happened to Simon Peter and who he became. And you know, there's a little secret to this, and we're going we're gonna to look at the initial verse on this that sort of tells the story, and then we're going to back it up, and we're going to go find the points as to how he got there. But here it is. It's in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and here's the key to Peter's success and pursuing his potential. Uh, verse 13, and this is what it says. I'll throw it up on the screen. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled, and here it is, and they realized they had been with Jesus. You know what? Here are these guys. They, they knew who these guys were because they were from Galilee, so they would have had Galilean accents. And they would have known where these people come from, what region. They would have known that they were uneducated and untrained men. Yet somehow, some way, when they spoke, there was such brilliance in the words they spoke. It says they marveled and they knew that there was only one way that they could have got there. And that was they had been with Jesus. See, when you're with Jesus, that is a game changer. I want to tell you a little story about this because uh, when I was in seminary, I spent three years studying New Testament Greek, which they call Koine Greek or Common Greek, distinct from Homer's Classical Greek. And the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. Now, Peter, the apostle, his first language would have been Aramaic, not Greek. And so here it was, I was studying the New Testament Greek. I spent the first two years learning the language and the vocabulary and the grammar and all of that. And then the third year, I only studied one thing. I spent a whole year studying 1 Peter, the writing of Peter, the first of his epistles. And what I did was I, with my newfound language skills, I translated the uh, book of Peter, 1 Peter, parsed every verse and exegeted the scripture. And I discovered something that you probably don't know, and I didn't know at the time, and it was this, that the two books of Peter, first and second, are the most exquisitely written books in the New Testament. The language skills are far and above uh, anything else, including the Apostle Paul. It is written in such high language skills of grammar and syntax and, and word usage that people marvel when they say, how could this man have written this? And so much so that liberal scholars deny that Peter wrote it. And they're saying there's no way that this uneducated fisherman, now he wasn't illiterate, but he was uneducated. There's no way that this guy could have used the language skills of a high class, highly educated person, sort of along the lines of how a university professor would talk today. And they don't believe that he could have written that, even though in both of those letters, he said he wrote it. Now, here's what I want to tell you from my firsthand experience as having been one of the people, probably maybe the only one in this room, that's actually read it in the original language. I can tell you this, that when you read this in the original language, you realize that this is the same person you see in the Gospels. See, when you get to know somebody and you get to know them intimately, you actually recognize their personality. When we write, we, our personality comes out. When I read First and Second Peter, I recognize this is the same Simon Peter that we find amongst Jesus 12. And it wasn't some forgery or written by someone else. Let me illustrate that with a, a story of my own, because I actually wrote a book of my own. Some of you know that, Greater Purpose, and it, which was sort of a surprise for many people here, because most of you know that by you know, the time I was 18 years old, I only read three books, two of them which were comic books. And uh, the other one was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, so anyway, so I wrote this book, and the very, very first person that read the manuscript was actually my daughter, the linguist. And I thought, you know, who better than this person that studies language to, to read the book? So I sent her the manuscript, and I said, read through, and let, let me know what you think. And so she came back after a few days, and she'd read it right through from cover to cover. And I said, so what did you think? She said, Pop, it's a really great book, but I got to tell you this. It drove me crazy reading it, because the whole time, I could hear your voice. 
It was as if the book was being narrated and you were in the room and I couldn't get rid of you. <laughs> and it was, it was so exciting to hear that because, you know, when you write, oftentimes you write like you speak. And that's what Peter did in his, in his epistles. He actually maybe used some extraordinary language skills, but it's still Peter. And somehow his personality is coming out of this. People are always surprised when someone that doesn't look like they have much potential actually rises to greatness. One of the people I love to poke fun at was former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. And I used to always say this, you know, he was the only Prime Minister in Canadian history that couldn't speak either of Canada's two official languages. <laughs> And uh, I know that was sort of cruel and stuff, but it's still pretty funny. And he was, he was at a conference, a free trade conference, with President Bill Clinton back in the day. And so Bill Clinton, during this discussion, it was all being taped and televised, and during this conversation, Bill Clinton says to him, so what do you think about the drugs coming across the border into Canada? To which Jean Chrétien says, well, it's just more, more trade. And he says that. And then, of course, Bill Clinton is like shocked by this and whispers something in his ear. And then Jean Chrétien says, oh, drugs. I thought you said trucks. <laughs> hey, Jean Chrétien, you had to love him, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Peter's journey. What was it that got him from this bumbling, stumbling individual to this super high achiever? And one of the stories, there's several places we could look, but the one we're going to look at is in Luke chapter 5, one of his first encounters uh, with Jesus. And here's the story, Luke chapter 5, uh, verse 1. It says, Now it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. So I want you to get the picture here for a moment, in that Jesus is speaking to this multitude. Somehow he's pushed right up against the sea or the lake, and uh, he's having trouble communicating. So he comes up with this idea. He'll get in one of these fishing boats. He'll float out a little bit from the land, and then the, the water will act like an amphitheater, and he'll be able to speak to this large crowd. Now, if you've ever been to Galilee, one of the things you can do is you can visit a, a museum where they have a first century fishing boat. Uh, from Peter's day. And here it is. This is exactly what it looks like. They found that in about the year 2000 on the bottom. There was a low water year. They rescued this thing and it's very carefully held together by this framework so you can go look at it. And imagine this boat being 2000 years old. And this is what a replica would look like. So if you can imagine this boat as to what it would look like uh, in Jesus' day. So they weren't huge boats. They were these small fishing boats. And I'm showing these pictures so you can kind of visualize this scenario that we're talking about here. So Jesus gets in this little boat, pushes a little off from the land. He's sitting there, and he's preaching to this crowd. Now, here's where we pick it up. Verse 4. Now, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Now, here's what's extraordinary about this story. Was Peter was a fisherman. He'd done it his whole life. And uh, when we see him out fishing, we don't see him catching anything. And here he is. He's gone out there. He's been fishing all night. He's caught nothing. That's what the story says. And so then Jesus gets in his boat and he goes out and everything changes. Now, let me ask you a question. I mean, because every time we see Peter, every single time, he doesn't catch any fish when he's on his own. You know what you call a fisherman who doesn't catch fish? A boater. They're just a boater. And so, you know, Peter, you know, I like boating. Peter's just a boater. He's out boating. And uh, he's not catching fish. And so what we see in this story is a place where he has gone from misfortune to great fortune. He caught a great number of fish. Whatever potential he had as a fisherman, it seemed to come out in this story. So there's a few things we're going to look at. This is what I call the Peter Prince. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Here's the, the steps here. Number one, get Jesus on board. Number two, ask for directions. Number three, make him your co pilot. So the first thing that happens is that he gets Jesus on board. And I'm wondering if you've noticed that as soon as Jesus is on board, his fortunes change. 
We never see him catching fish, and all of a sudden he's catching fish, and not just a few fish, but a great number of fish. I want to illustrate this with a, a, a personal story because I've actually fished uh, my whole adult life, uh, even longer than that. I started as a kid, probably fished for 50 years. How many of you are fishermen in the room? Any fishermen in the room? Are you good ones or average ones? Average or good? Average, you're good, a few average, mostly average. I mean, you know, I'm like a golfer. I've done it for 50 years and I'm never getting any better. And, uh, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm fishing and know my lake, fish the same places all the time. And I'll go out and I'll catch, you know, two or three fish. That's pretty good enough for dinner. My brother decides one day he's going to host this event with a bunch of guys and he's going to hire a guide and he invites me to come along with the fishing guide on the same lake that I already fish. And I'm thinking to myself, what do we need a guide for? I know this lake, I know where the fish are, I know how to fish. Nevertheless, I said, sure, I'll come along. So here's the story. We get in the boat, the guide gets in the boat. We go onto the same lake that I fish every summer, and the four of us, in three hours by noon, caught 56 walleye. 56 in three hours. And let me point out something, that the guide didn't do any of the fishing. He sat at the back of the boat and he told us where to go and he told us what bait to use and he told us how to fish and all of a sudden I went from a three fish fisherman to a 56 fish fisherman. You know, I'll tell you, there's something extraordinary about that. I would have never thought that that kind of potential was there in the same lake that I fish. And here's my point. When Jesus gets into Peter's boat, boat everything changes. What happens when Jesus gets into your boat? And I sort of see this as the game changer for Peter. Once Jesus became involved seriously in his life, once he put Jesus into his life, things started to roll in a completely new direction. I mean, we look at Peter. I mean, you had to kind of admit he was a bit of a failure. Couldn't catch fish, always making mistakes, impetuous. He was always speaking out of turn, sticking his foot in his mouth. I mean, he was the one who denied Jesus three times. And yet you go into the book of Acts and you find this same man standing up on the day of Pentecost and preaching one of the greatest sermons of all time and 3,000 people came to Christ in one day. That's Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 3, he goes to the beautiful gate and heals the lame man that was at the gate for years and years and years and years. Acts chapter 4, we see Peter leading the church of Jerusalem that some estimate had 100,000 converts in it. And so it turns out that Peter, 2,000 years ago, was the first megachurch pastor in all of history, the same anonymous fisherman from the Sea of Galilee. There was some potential that came out in him just by virtue of the fact that he got Jesus on board in his life. And I, I started thinking about this, and I realized that, you know, God has this sort of penchant of picking losers and turning them into winners. How many of you have noticed that in Scripture? So we're going to play a little game today. It's interactive, so please participate. And this game is called Winner or Loser. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a name, and the, basically we're going to ask you this. Before this person met the Lord in a significant way in their life, were they a winner or a loser? So I'll name a name, and you tell me winner or loser. Ready? So let's just start with a, someone you all know. Um, Charlie Sheen, winner or loser? OK. I'm going to have to teach you how to play this game. Like, when he's a winner, when this person is a winner, you go, winner! Everybody say, winner! OK? And if the person is a loser, you have to say it like this. You say, loser! You put, you put the L up. Let's try it. Ready? One, two, three, loser! Now, some of you used your left hand. Now, if you lose your left hand, then the L is backwards. That makes you the loser. Come on, people, concentrate here. I don't want that to happen to you. And so it has to be the right hand. It has to be the L. We're going to try it one more time. Winner or loser? Ready? Loser. Winner? Ready? One, two, three. Winner? Winner. OK, now we're there. All right, we're going to tr try a few guys. Before they encountered the Lord, winner or loser? Jacob. Loser. Really? Just loser? Just loser? You're not sure? He was a loser! Let me, let me tell you about this guy. I mean, this was the guy that was a mama's boy, had to steal his brother's inheritance. I mean, he was the one who worked for 14 years to get his wife. He was such a loser. And yet, in the end, he becomes the father of Israel. But you know, if you're going to play this game, you've got to do it right. 
Winner, loser, loud with enthusiasm. Ready? I'm going to give you one more try. Ready? Joseph, winner or loser? loser? That's right, loser. Why was he such a loser? He was sold as a slave by his own brothers, for goodness sakes, yet he saved all of Israel. Ready? Here's another one. Moses, winner or loser? Loser, that's right. I mean, here was a guy that was on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years, tending his father-in-law's sheep, and yet he goes and delivers Israel from Egypt and became a winner. All right, one more, one more. Ready? Gideon, winner or loser? Loser, big loser. You know, least in his father's house, the weakest clan in all Manasseh, and yet he goes on and defeats the Midianites and becomes the judge over Israel for 40 years. So you look at these people. Let me give you a couple of quick ones, superhero type things. Clark Kent, winner or loser? Loser. Peter Parker, winner or loser? Loser. Bruce Wayne, winner or loser? Winner. Are you kidding me? Millionaire, playboy, philanthropist, genius. Doesn't get any better than Bruce Wayne. That was a trick. Now here's my whole point. You did good. You did good in the game. My whole point is this that God takes broken down people that can't seem to discover their potential and he turns them into something. You know, I want to talk about my own journey for a minute here because I've never lacked self-confidence. You probably know that. I've always been this overly confident person, always been very bold, but I've not always been very successful in life. And I'll, I'll tell you an early story. After Kathy and I got married, uh, we were renting a house living in, in Winnipeg, and neither of us have jobs at the time. There's a term for that. They call it Unemployment is what they call it. And here we were, we were both unemployed, and, and so I needed to get a job, and I needed to get a job in a hurry because we're renting a house and we're trying to make a life and we're newly married. And so I don't know how you get a job, but I had an idea as how I was going to do this. Most people go down, find human resources person, put in an application, apply for a job. I decided what I was going to do was phone company presidents in the downtown Winnipeg and see if I could get interviews with them. And so I I know this is bizarre. This story is actually in my book, A Greater Purpose, and you can hear the fuller story. But here, here's what I did. So I literally started phoning companies, and I managed to get an interview with the president of Pioneer Grain. And I went up to see him on the 28th floor. Why he saw me, I'll never know. But I went up to see him on the 28th floor, went into his big, huge corner office with these huge glass windows overseeing the whole city, sat across from his desk. And as I sat down, he said, now, why are we meeting? To which I said, I need a job. And he said, oh. And he says, and what exactly could you do for us? To which I said, remember, I didn't lack confidence. To which I said, I can do whatever you want me to do. He says, I think that would be for someone else to determine. Then he asked me this. He says, so what are you doing now? To which I said, nothing. <laughs> and then, and then, he, then he said, so what's your wife doing? I said, nothing. <laughs> and then he said, well, then you really need a job. And I said, yes, sir. Now we're tracking. I said, yes, sir, I really need a job. Now, I wasn't looking to get his corner office. I mean, the one next to him would be fine. Or even the one at the end of the hall, as long as it had nice glass windows overlooking the city, I'd be good with that, right? And so anyway, he says, you really need a job. And he says, I think I can help you. And I'm thinking, now we're getting somewhere. And he takes a card, a business card, and he slides it across the desk like this. And he says, I just met this guy in the elevator. And he says, he is the maintenance manager for the building. And I understand they're looking for help. And why don't you go down to the basement where his office is and see him, and maybe you can find some work. That was one of the most humiliating moments of my life. I politely took the card, put it in my pocket, went down the elevator, not to the basement, but to the main floor and walked out of that building, humiliated and feeling like I was two centimeters tall. And you know, I just realized that I wasn't nearly as spectacular as I thought I was. And why these people didn't understand my greatness was beyond me. And you see, I think that's what happens a lot of times with us, is that we think we're something we're not. And yet, God knows that even when you're kind of a, I'm going to admit it, winner or loser, I was sort of a loser. And when I did things, they didn't always work out. Even though I was educated and even though I was confident, it wasn't always working out. And when I look today at how God has used me, I marvel. And I think, you know, and I'm grateful. And I realize it has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with the fact that I got Jesus on board in my life. 
Getting Jesus on board in your life is the game changer. Now, let me give you a little caveat on this because just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have Jesus on board. And I see all kinds of people that I would say don't have a truly Christocentric life where Christ is in the center of their life. And we have people, they come to church and they go home, they live their life like they aren't Christians at all. And there is some subtle difference between being a Christian and getting Christ on board in your life so that everything you do revolves around him. And if you want your business to succeed, you've got to get Jesus in the midst of it. If you want your relationships to succeed, you've got to get Jesus in the midst of it. If you want your marriage to succeed, you need to get Christ in the midst of it. Now, let, me, let me tell you something. I always, when I do wedding ceremonies, I always point out to the couple, I say, don't, don't live for one another. I said, there's a law in physics that if two separate objects move towards a third and a central object, they by necessity move closer together. You understand that principle, don't you? And if you live for one another, who knows what's going to happen. But if you put Christ in the center of your marriage, you can move closer together. And when you are moving towards Christ in your marriage, you have a very high chance of succeeding. But without him, even as a Christian, it's 50-50. The divorce rate in the church, same as in the world. There's something wrong with that. And I remember quite a few years ago, we had this call from this couple in the church. They were really struggling in their marriage. Kathy and I got down in our car and we went and visited them and we sat there and it was clear to me that, that Christ wasn't center place in their marriage and they were fighting and arguing and they weren't living like Christians. And I explained this principle I just explained to you and I said, if you could get Christ in the midst of this marriage, you would have a chance of succeeding. And then Kathy decides she's going to be helpful and she says, you know, that's right. If Mark and I hadn't been Christians, I would have left him a long time ago. <laughs> And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> no, I, I didn't say anything because it was inopportune. But as soon as we got in the car, we're driving home. I think, what was that all about? If, you, if we weren't Christians, you would have met, left me a long time ago. She says, well, let's face it, Mark. You're not the easiest person in the world to be married to. <laughs> and if it weren't for Christ, I don't know if I'd be hanging around. And you know, as hurtful as that was, I think there's truth to it. I think what we need is Christ in the midst of our lives. And if we can get him on board, everything can change. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this, is that we need to ask him for directions. It's not good enough to just get him in the boat. You've got to get directions from him. So he says to Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. And remember what Peter said? He said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, the likelihood in Peter's mind that they would catch fish during the day if they couldn't catch them at night was pretty slim. And he didn't really want to do it, if you think about it. In the natural sense, he's saying, this is not great advice. And yet, he says this, yet nevertheless, at your word, we will let down the net. And so what he did was he obeyed Jesus' instructions and everything changed. And I think the key for us is we need to ask Jesus for direction in life. You know, someone once said that, that there was no reason that Moses and the children of Israel had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. But Moses, being a guy, wouldn't stop and ask for directions. <laughs> and a lot of us are like that. We don't stop and ask for directions. I want to tell you a story today, speaking of potential, about a man by the name of George Washington Carver. I don't know if you're familiar with this man. There's a picture of him. He was born in 1860. He was the son of a slave, so he's born into slavery. And uh, his prospects in life didn't look very good. But what ended up happening, it's a longer story, but he ended up going to school and going to university. He ended up eventually actually becoming a professor in a university. He was a botanist and he was a scientist. And uh, he was a devout Christian man. And one day he asked the Lord this. He said, Lord, show me the secret to your universe. And the Lord spoke to him, however God does that. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you can't handle the secret of the universe, but I will show you the secret of the peanut. Remember, he was a botanist. He was a plant guy. And so here's the story of George Washington Carver. He found more uses for the peanut than any other human in all of history. And he discovered 300 different uses, from oils to plastics to foods 
to shampoos, to soap, the list went on and on and on and on, 300 different uses. In fact, George Washington Carver is responsible for rehabilitating the southern economy in his, in his years because that's what they grew. They grew peanuts. And so he became immensely f famous for his involvement in, in the peanut. And after he felt like he had exhausted everything he could discover about the peanut, he decided to take it to another level. And he, one day he picked up the sweet potato and he said, Lord, Show me the secret of the sweet potato. <laughs> and, and he came up with 115 uses of the sweet potato. And so here's a guy that merely asked the Lord, and the Lord gave him directions in life. You say, well, that doesn't work for me. Well, you know what? You have not because you ask not. You say, well, you don't understand, Pastor Mark. I've asked the Lord again and again for direction in life, and I, I'm hearing nothing. Well, here's my advice. Go read the owner's manual. There's all kinds of advice in the owner's manual. You know what I'm talking about, the Bible, the human owner's manual. He didn't just put you into this world to you know, leave you to your own devices. He gave you an instruction manual. He gave you an owner's manual. And the scripture says that everything within it was there that pertains to life and godliness. Any help you need. See, if I was struggling in my finances, I'd go read the book of Proverbs. Because there's more on finances there than anywhere else in the Bible. If I'm struggling in my relationships, in my marriage, I'm going to go to the epistles of Peter and of Paul and read what they say about relationships. If I'm struggling in my spiritual life, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go read the red stuff. The stuff in the red, in the Gospels, Jesus' words. And everywhere you look in Scripture, there's something that can help you. And God is giving you directions. Peter merely said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my nets. Lord, at your word, and once we obey his word, everything changes. Let me tell you a historical story about this. Uh, how many of you have read Mutiny on the Bounty, that book? How many have read that? A few of you, not that many, but you know the story. And the story happens in 1790. The Bounty is a ship, and it's out in the middle of the Pacific. And there's a mutiny on board. And the captain is Captain Bly, and the mutineer, the head mutineer, is a man by the name of Fletcher Christian. And he rebels against the captain. And the end of the story goes like this. The Captain Bly is put into a lifeboat. And he sails 3,600 miles in a 23-foot lifeboat to safety. He actually manages to survive. Now, this is actually a true story. It's not a novel. It's a true story. And there's an ending to this story. Because now what we have is we have Fletcher Christian and uh, his nine mutineers. And we have six uh, Tahitian men and 11 Tahitian women. And they're out in the middle of the Pacific. And they can't go to land anywhere because they're going to get arrested and tried for, as mutineers. And so they have to go somewhere to live. And so what ends up happening is this ship goes and it lands on Pitcairn Island. Now, Pitcairn Island, here's the map. This is where it is. It's right smack in the middle of the South Pacific, as far away from anything as you could possibly go. Here's a picture of the actual island. You can see it's not a big island. And they landed on this island, and this group of people, mutineers, get us off on this island. And the first thing they do is build a still to distill alcohol. And then they live for the next several years, drunken and debaucherous lives, and are basically wasting away. Within 10 years, by the year 1800, all of the mutineers and all of the other men are dead, except for one by the name of John Adams. There's a few Tahitian women and scores of, of Tahitian children that who knows who, par who the parents were of these kids. And so John Adams looks and says, you know what? We've almost lost everybody through either drunkenness or, or murder. And there's no way we're going to survive any longer unless something changes. And he goes to the chest that came off the bounty. And in that chest was a copy of the Bible, which incidentally he had not been reading. And he begins to read the Bible and realizes that within the Bible is a blueprint for life and even to build a society. And he decides that he's going to teach the Bible to these children and to these women. And within the next few years, he completely transforms that little community, that little culture on Pitcairn Island. It was 18 years before anybody arrived at Pitcairn Island. It was the year 1808. And the USS Topaz arrived there to find this thriving, prosperous, successful community with a school and a church and people living in homes and, and growing crops and, and doing advancements. And they had transformed this community from complete utter chaos into something successful, all because what they did was they took the word of God and applied it to their life. Use that as a metaphor for your own life. Wherever you are, whatever potential you have, it won't really come out 
until you begin to look at the blueprint. So the first thing is this, you need to get Jesus on board. The second thing is that you need to uh, ask for his directions. And when you ask for his directions, everything changes. And then the last and the final thing is this, you need to make him your co-pilot. And uh, you know, how many of you have seen that, that bumper sticker? Maybe some of you have it, Jesus is my co-pilot. How many of you have seen that? And I'm always thinking, if Jesus is your co-pilot, like switch seats. Uh, you know, if Jesus is your co-pilot, you've got an idiot driving that car. You know, I'm always trying to improve the bumper stickers. And uh, all kidding aside, uh, we want to get Jesus on board, and we want to take his directions, but we don't want him backseat driving. What would happen if we actually gave him control of our life? And I think of Peter, that when Jesus got on the boat with him, I don't think Peter was still the captain. Do you? I think what he did when Jesus got on the boat, Jesus became the captain. You know, Peter became Gilligan, right? That's what, that's what happened there. And something happens when you give the control of your life over to the great power that moves all creation. So let me close with one final story here. And it's uh, something that happened in this church with a man in this church. And some of you know him. How many of you remember Cujo? We had a, a Ghanan man by the, by the name of Cujo. He's a great guy, a great leader in our church, a good friend. And unfortunately, he passed away of cancer a few years ago. And he came to Canada as an immigrant. And uh, Cujo was one of these people that just loved Jesus. And it was amazing how quickly he adjusted to North American culture and how successful he came. He started several businesses. They were all successful. He started a driving school. And he had several cars on the road and several instructors. And he called his business Cujo and Partners. And I remember always wondering, who are these partners of his? And I'm thinking, they're not his kids. His kids are like three and four years old. And so one day I said, Cujo, I'm just curious. Your company's called Cujo and Partners. Who are your partners? He says, well, I have three partners. I said, who are they? He says, they're the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are my partners. And that's why I succeed. <laughs> you know, if we could get Jesus on board, if we could start listening to his instructions, and if we could give him the, the steering wheel and turn the, our life over to him, you would be amazed what would happen. You have more potential in your life than you could ever imagine. Whatever you've done and however you're old, you, how old you are, it doesn't matter. God has more for you. And my passion and vision for you is for you to pursue your own potential. Let's stand together, shall we? All right, I want to do one thing before we go here, and I'm wondering if you could all bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And we always do this. We close every service like this because I know there are people in this room that haven't got Jesus on board yet. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And the way you do that is you invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And I'm not going to call you forward or single you out or ask you to say anything publicly, but right where you are, if you don't have Jesus on board in your life, if you were to die tonight, you don't even know if you go to heaven, I'm talking to you. And I won't call you forward, like I said, but if that's you, and you need to release more of your potential, I just want you to raise your hand. And right now, and you're saying, yes, I need Jesus in my life. And there's hands popping up around the room. You've never made Jesus your Lord. I'm going to add the second part to this. Maybe you knew him in the past, and you've fallen away. And he's no longer on board. Why don't you join these folks too and raise your hands as well? All right, a bunch more hands. Okay, everybody can lower their hands. We're going to all pray together though because I don't want to single, single anybody out. Ready? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. I thank you that you died for my sin. And on the third day you rose again. And you forever live to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Today I'm a new creation in Christ. And I invite you to come on board in my life. And I will attend my ear to your direction. And I'm turning the steering wheel over to you. And saying, Lord, lead me into victory and success. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a hand today, shall we?